technical difficulties, let us know in the chat and let us know where you're tuning in from. We love letting learning where people are tuning in from and we are monitoring the chat throughout the entire event. Number three, we will have time for questions tonight for, for both in-person and virtual attendees. So even if you're watching via Zoom, you can participate. Please put those questions in the Q&A feature so that we will see them and can ask on your behalf. And finally, and most importantly, if you need to purchase a copy of tonight's books, we have copies available and we'd be happy to help you out with that. They are upstairs at the register, not on the shelves, and they can be purchased prior to the signing line. We are so honored to be hosting this event tonight and to talk more about the genre-bending memoir that explores the aftershocks of alcoholism and mental illness through a fresh look at the powers of poetry, ritual, and community. Maybe redemption is not a place you find, but a system of map making. Sketch a land, pencil in dragons, imagine it real, resplendent, and broken under a waxing moon. Our author of the evening is John West, who is a writer and technolo te technologist. Currently, he reports the news with code at the Wall Street Journal, where his work has won an award for business journalism, two New York press clubs, a Philip Meyer Award for data journalism, and most recently, a Pulitzer Prize. He holds an MFA in writing from the Bennington Writers Seminars and degrees in philosophy and music performance from Oberlin College and Conservatory. His reportage, essays, and fiction have also appeared in the Washington Post, Fast Company, Courts, and Four Way Review. Lessons and Carols is his first book. And joining him in conversation is Sandra Beasley, who is the author of Don't Kill the Birthday Girl. Her nonfiction has appeared in the New York Times, Washington Post, Virginia Quarterly Review, Creative Nonfiction, Lit Hub, and A Harp in the Stars. She's the author of four poetry collections and most recently, Made to Explode, which won the Houstonic Book Award, and she edited Vinegar and Char, verse from the Southern Foodways Alliance. Honors include the Munster Literary Center's John Montage Fellowship, an NEA Fellowship, and six DC commissions on the Arts and Humanities Fellowships. Please welcome our authors for the evening. Good evening, how are we doing today? And hello to those uh, watching from at home or wherever on, uh, on Zoom as well, welcome. Um, I am so delighted to be in conversation tonight with you, John. And uh, I, I, I know you're, you're about to jump in. I will just, um, in a sense, turn it over to you just to give kind of a brief uh, introduction about this book, which I just absolutely loved reading. Hello? Great. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I, I'm terrible at talking about my book, but um, I will do my best. Um, so uh, Lessons and Carols, I call it a long essay. It's billed as a memoir. It's written in short fragments. Uh, so there are 160 odd fragments in this book. Um, some are a couple sentences long, some are over a page long. Um, they all um, kind of grapple with one of four themes. Um, you know, there's stuff about me raising my daughter. There's stuff about um, uh, struggles with mental health and addiction. There's stuff about Christmas and there's stuff about, <laughs> uh, and we'll talk about that in a sec. Uh, and there's, there's also stuff about, uh, people who I know who have passed away, um, from their addictions. The, the title of the book lessons and carols refers to an Anglican tradition called the lessons and carols, which is, um, uh, pretty fun. Uh, it's, uh, started <laughs> the, the shout, shout out for the Episcopalians in the house. Um, the, uh, we did it at my church. We did five. It was a congregational church, not an Episcopal church. We did five, uh, not nine. Cause I guess we couldn't, couldn't <laughs> suffer through the whole thing. Um, but, uh, the, the gist of it was that in 1880 something, um, E.W. Benson, who goes on to become the Archbishop of Canterbury, which is kind of like the Pope, but for Episcopal sort of, uh, highest office in the Anglican Church. Um, uh, he is worried, maybe apocryphally, he's worried that everyone's going to go out drinking uh, because the cathedral at Truro is under construction. And so he puts together what would should be a real banger, which is nine verses that you're going to read from the Bible and nine carols that everyone's going to sing. Uh, and I guess it's a big success. Uh, but uh, in World War I, they, they, uh, King's College in Cambridge redoes the, the service uh, with new works for organ and choir. And it's a big deal. And it gets put on the radio and then other churches start taking it up and pretty soon you've got weird congregational churches in the middle of Minnesota <laughs> doing it, but only five. And so that's, yeah. And so I named the book after that. Um, 
in part because I like the title Lessons and Carols. I thought it was fun. You know, there are lessons, there are carols in this book, maybe, you know, like it's kind of that, yeah. but it also there's more stuff going on. Um, and also I, I structured the book after it. So the book is com comprised of fragments, but those fragments are chunked into, into the Lessons and Carols. Um, is that, is that? That's wonderful. Yeah. No, you've, you've passed the party test. Sure. <laughs> um, I, I think though you've almost hidden how skillfully these sections are, are arranged. I mean, not just the larger framing structure, but that individual juxtaposition, these beautiful lyric passages, as you said, varying in length. And I thought what we would do is I've picked out some passages that I'd love to hear John read. I'd love to hear him in his own voice. And I have kind of questions paired with those that'll help everyone know a little bit more about the book and maybe what went into the craft of, of shaping the book. All right, are you game for that? I'm totally game. That's All right. Okay. Um, I am going to begin at the beginning as it were, uh, a, a section that for those following along in their own books is on, uh, I believe, pages four and five. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I will, yeah, I won't cue you up beyond that. I'll, I'll turn it over. Sure. So this is the very opening. Um, Caring for this baby has taught me new ways to resent. Other people tell me things, absurd things, things about seeing with baby's eyes, etc. And I resent that I do, in fact, sometimes see with baby's eyes. Like in the morning when a blue gray bird whose name I don't know preens on my white picket fence, when there are titters I've never noticed before from the swallows in the oak, when once Galen and I spy a morning dove in the cemetery near our house. I mean, honestly, I often say that summer is the most desirable season, but I confess I wish it were winter. I wish the moon weren't an abstract expressionist hurling silver onto my neighbor's oak, watching its handiwork drip down onto my short cut grass. I wish the baby were older. I wish I were older, were not resentful, re and sent, feeling again all the time. But I am resentful, and she is still a baby, and the moon, yes, hello moon, is just as annoyingly beautiful as ever. Thank you. I love this section not only for its cantankerousness of tone, uh, but also for what it does counter to what we would expect of narrative. Um, for those who haven't read the book yet, it becomes clear pretty quickly that this baby's entrance into the narrator's life comes much later than a lot of the other scenes that we uh, witness early on. And I'm just curious for you what the decision making was in allowing that presence to manifest so early in the book rather than having a traditional arc where maybe that's one of the the closing gestures that happens i have a i have a pet theory that um maybe this is maybe this is mean of to say about memoir but that that memoir as a genre has a problem which is that you can't keep writing after you're dead and there's always <laughs> better ways of understanding what happened to you you know after you finished writing a book about your life there's always something new that can come along and change how you understood your own past. And I think that that's just a true part of the human like condition or whatever, is that like we, we learn new things about ourselves over time. Those new things Im influence how we see ourselves in the past. And so there's always a truer kind of better way of understanding what's going on. Anyway. So I, I, I intentionally messed up time and put new things, you know, the things that were happening more present in the writing process early in the book and scattered throughout. And then part of the the reason I did that was to try to cue, and the book is also all written in present tense, which gets, I know, very confusing for readers sometimes because <laughs> uh, they don't know where they are. Um, but the idea was I wanted, I wanted people, readers to, to kind of be cued into the idea that, that I'm not trying to make an authoritative statement about this is my memoir, you know, and that's why I kind of call it, I try to call it an essay oftentimes um, because I, I, I distrust the idea of narrative. And, you know, when it comes to talking about nonfiction, I think it's really challenging to, to graft into a person's whole life um, kind of a narrative and, and hang things off of it. When it seems to me so often that it's just kind of this cyclical mess of stuff that happens and we make sense of it in different ways and new and different ways all the time. Yeah. Great. Um, that makes a lot of sense to me. And, you know, any, any, uh, a lot of women who have written memoirs have commented upon the external pressure to either get married at the end, have a baby at the end, or get divorced by the <laughs> end, right? Yeah, these kind of artificial capstones on the arc of a life. Um, I want to hear another section that offers a, a different glimpse of what this narrator has experienced, a different scene, a different set of concerns. And that's on page uh, nine. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I am fluttering on the edge of a couch in the dorm's common room. I'm the youngest here, a mascot. I'm on my second glass of wine. A body passes before the spindly light and the shadows lurch into a different form. A glass or two later, I am not so nervous. A man in his 20s sits across the room from me on a stained love seat. The soprano is draped on his arm and she is bending forward, laughing without dignity. He smirks at his own wit. His eyes catch mine and the smile that takes his face would devour me. 
I want to be eaten. I'm ignoring the talk around me to hold eye contact with this man when the wine in my throat and stomach solidifies. I stand up too quickly, walk to the door. Then, suddenly, the man is beside me. Going home, he asks. My whole body is tingling. Walk me, I reply. In the long field between the rows of dorms, he puts his hand on my forearm. Look, he says, and I look at the dark mountain-shaped hole in the night jutting out over the end of the field. I look at the moonlight draped on the branches of a tree, at the shadows splashed across the tall grass. He leans toward me, like kisses are just things that anyone might give to anyone else at any time. I have never been kissed. Neon fireflies flare in the dark like the tips of cigarettes. The next few evenings, I cycle through different dorms, different common rooms, a gulp of gin and tonic here, a half inch of scotch there. Each night, I crisscross the field to find the man who kissed me. Each evening that I find him, blushes bloom across my face. We don't kiss again. Great. And uh, it's it's a gorgeous and immersive passage for so many different reasons, but I also appreciate the fact that the relationship with alcohol in some sections is in the foreground. In the uh, in other sections, it's it's there, it's present, but it's not the central tension. Uh, and the ways that the kind of dips in and out of sobriety, you know, some of them are high stakes uh, slips, and some of them are low stakes. Some there seem to be some moments where it's just like no, gosh darn it, I'm just going to pour something today, you know, and I, and I don't know um, for you if, if that handling that aspect of the book required reprocessing, you know, that, that emotional journey for you, or I'm curious if you'd speak to yeah. that. Yeah. So my, uh, a friend of mine, um, the writer Hugh Ryan, I don't know if you guys have read his work. He's an amazing writer. Um, and he went to grad school with, with us. Uh, I see Britt there. Someone else in the audience went to grad school with them. Uh, he, um, he had told me once, and I love this line. I think he took it from someone else, but I'm, I'm going to credit him. And so he can <laughs> uh, say, but he said that you, you can't actually, you know, writing a book is not cathartic. You have to do the catharsis first, and then you get to write the book. Mm -hmm. I think that's actually really true. Like, I, I think I wrote, a, I wrote over a hundred thousand words and this is a 35,000 word book. Um, and so a lot of it was just left around like in Google docs or word docs or wherever it is. I think a lot of those words were not ready yet. I was not ready yet to write the book. And it, it became abundantly clear to me that I did have reprocessing to do. And so I did that, you know, with my friends and in therapy and in all the places that you do that kind of stuff. And then I came back and, and tried to write again. And I think that, that that was an important step, realizing that I was not ready yet to, mm -hmm. to write. Does that, I don't know if that. Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, you mentioned Bennington. And I do think that, it, you know, when folks have the opportunity to do a, a Master of Fine Arts, a creative writing study, um, it tends to put whatever work they brought to the program in dialogue with other genres, other authors. And I feel like that cues us up beautifully to, to read a short trio of passages that I feel really captures some of the lyric qualities of the book and also the, the dialogue with other texts, right? So that starts on page uh, 27 and it's the kind of trio. Yep, okay. But translation is a lossy process. Take a screenshot of a picture, take a screenshot of that, Take a screenshot of that. Watch it degrade in each iteration. Loss. I tell N that I know he brought the booze to that girl's party where we all got kicked out, and he says he'll take a piss test if that's what it takes, and then he's dead. Loss. A and I wake early, sip coffee from travel mugs on our way to take a modern dance class together, and then one day she doesn't call back, and then her internet profiles wink out one by one, and then her number stops working. Loss. Robert Hass. All the new thinking is about loss. In this, it resembles all the old thinking. I read somewhere that young people always think they invented sex. I sometimes feel I invented mourning. This is foolish. I've read Catullus. I know I didn't invent mourning, but having broken a person down to their component memories, I can't help but feel that I've disco discovered something when the parts did not make a whole. And then this is after Catullus. It's, this is actually, I'm just going to say it. This is actually a direct, pretty direct translation of Catullus's 101st uh, poem, which is an analogy for his brother. This world is not mine. I travel it anyway. Suddenly I'm at your tomb where I myself lay death gifts. I alone ask questions. Of course, you do not. Of course, you do not answer. How senseless the violence of fate, which has cleaved us. And all I have is ritual and tears. Um, thank you for it. That was it felt like I traveled across centuries just then. But I, you know, I think that those integrating those types of elements is challenging uh, because you're already working a chronologically, a chronologically, you're already outside time. And then two of those three have a kind of static quality, right? Because you're in that meditation mode of the title. So I'm just curious, did you find yourself having to um, kind of fuss with the pacing of the book? Did you, did you have trusted readers to help with that? Yeah, I think, I think, 
trusted readers who are very annoyed with me after draft 8,000. <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, it's interesting. So, so the Catullus, okay, so I made a spreadsheet of my book and each row is one of the fragments. Um, <laughs> Chad, uh, my colleague Chad is also a data journalist. And he said, of course you did it. We welcome heckling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I made a spreadsheet in my book and each row was a fragment. And I I listed who, if anyone, was was kind of cited in that. So in this, Robert Haas was cited in this, uh, Catullus was cited, you know, and so on and so forth. And I actually made sure that they recurred. Um, mm -hmm. So every author who's cited in the book once has cited at least twice. Um, and that was a decision that I made in order to try to weave mm -hmm. those citations in, in such a way that, that they, that they changed along with the book, that the context around them changed or that they were doing something to the context to change it. And all of this is to say that like, you know, that, that process of re re constant refinement and like, and like getting the balance between kind of what I call the aphoristic sections and the more plot driven sections, mm -hmm. um, like keeping that balance on point, like one of the one of the functions that those citations um, can kind of serve is to to aphorize a more plot driven section, and you can take one out, and all of a sudden it becomes more plotty in some ways. I, mm -hmm. I like I found I found that, that was like a lever I could I could pull to to control how um, how plot driven was it what one of the fragments was, and that was an important part of the balance of the the book. Um, if you ever want to see a spreadsheet about it, I can definitely show it to you. Yeah. 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 Heather Crystal talks about a similar kind of color-coded pattern making for the crying book. It's a great uh, book. She used graph paper. I'm sure your nerd heart uh, could respond to that. <laughs> I actually, I actually, um, this is a, a thing that only a, maybe a few people would really love, but I, um, I built a D3 app uh, of my book so I could actually see like visualize charts and graphs. I like totally did like as if it were data journalism. I did that to my book um, and it was really fun. I mean, it, it, uh, I don't know how useful it was, but uh, the spreadsheet was really useful. The visualization was probably just for just kill time. <laughs> so, you, you do a lot of things to not write, you know, like, and that was one of them. Usually most of us settle for word clouds, <laughs> but you, you went a, a level up. Um, Let's move on to uh, another section. Uh, this is a little bit deeper in the book. Uh, it's from one of the Carol sections, and it carries the the section carries the dedication for C. And you, we've already heard uh, an example of someone who's denoted only just by a letter, right? So um, I'd love to hear this section, and then maybe have you talk a little bit about these other figures, other characters uh, who come and go in the book. Sure. And which page is that? This is page fifty one. I sit with C at the halfway house on the metal chairs at the metal table in the courtyard with rocks that are strewn about haphazardly as though by a child. Trying unsuccessfully to make to make rings, we watch the cigarette smoke eddy up and break on the wind. After discussing the relative merits of dogs versus cats, we start in on the discussion we always have, how we just don't know what we'll do when we're out of this place. The night tech comes out to find us in serious conversation. He says he'll give us a few more minutes if we need it, and we nod solemnly. C tells me about Fred G, a process in which you write down your fears, resentments, moments of ego, deceptions, and then what you're grateful for. You've got to make the gratitude section just as important as the Fred part, she says. If we're, if we're supposed to make it just as important, then there should be four, at least four letters in the last part too, I reply, <laughs> always the formalist. The night tech comes back and shoes us to bed. We've barely made it through fears. Later, I will forget nearly all of C's ambitions. I will remember only the clinical details, the disorders they diagnosed her with, the eager impotence of her sponsor, nothing important. And of course, you know, in, in that moment, the the narrator says, I forgot all these things, but they're they're recovered in a sense. They're recovered for the sake of this book. And I wonder if you'll just talk a little bit about what you had to weigh in terms of including these characters, where you drew the line in terms of privacy, what you yeah. felt like your your motivation was in building that world. So none of them are composites. They are actually mm -hmm. people. Um, I tried to include details that were not actually all that descriptive um, or not actually all that identifying. Um, I think it's possible that if someone knew me and was like in that halfway house with me and see, they might might know who that I'm talking about. But I don't, I'm not actually totally sure they would. Um, I really did, did my best to try to mm -hmm. obfuscate some of those more identifying details. Um, the reason for that is I don't feel like it's really my place to tell those stories in this way. I think, you know, it's interesting. I'm, I'm a journalist in my day yeah. job. And like, I think there's like something really valuable and powerful about, about that act, but this book is not journalism. And I think that it's like a really important 
like an important mode like modal difference that like has implications or ramifications for um how how i like the, what, what, the, what the ethical considerations are right there's no there's no you know no one knew that i was going to write this book when i was at that halfway house and so i i think there's a very different ethical concern that comes comes to, to play um so i i use letters for people as opposed to their names um and also like i should i should say that like we we discover very soon that c disappears i mean i actually don't know what happened to mm -hmm. c um mm -hmm. and and that is um also kind of a an interesting uh ethical problem for me I, I couldn't I asked a lot of the people that are in the book about how they felt about how I was describing them which again is something you wouldn't really do in journalism uh, but I did it here and and uh and you know I can't I can't do that with C and yeah and I, and that makes me that made me very uncomfortable mm -hmm. but um that's, mm -hmm. that's the way it yeah. is and are you pulling on uh just recollection do you have any kind of diary notes correspondence anything from this earlier area of your life that you were revisiting yeah so i i um gmail is crazy man oh. it's got like everything in there um <laughs> uh there's a great uh there's a great um uh a great mit project that someone did where they just looked at the metadata in your gmail and it you can you can do it over time and it would show like you know like this is the network of who you email and they break and you can like roll over time and see how it changes over time and as your friends change and as your work change. it's very spooky anyway so yeah, gmail is very powerful it's got everything in there so they did a lot of gmail stuff i also did keep um some journals um that i have they're mostly to-do lists which is like <laughs> surprisingly unhelpful but um maybe not surprising it just is unhelpful um but it's actually some of it was useful to think what were my concerns you know get a job you know uh you know call the call the call the coffee shop manager back you know it was like things that you know this was early recovery for me i was you know anyway so um so yeah i look i use those journals and i use gmail a lot yeah yeah there actually are a few quick glimpses of of the narrator at work or in a job you know which is kind of it's it, it's because we're all in present tense because we're moving around in time it's it's funny when those moments happen right. um did you find yourself tempted to include more of that and then being like no this isn't the, yeah. <laughs> this is the, the more the more detail you include there's a, there's a balance to strike because it's all in the present tense and because you're kind of disoriented in in time um the more detail you include you have to be really careful that it's not accidentally um referencing a recurring you know if i said i'm at the coffee shop I have to make sure that that coffee shop is the same coffee shop that I'm referring to 20 pages mm -hmm. earlier, yeah. or else the readers can be really confused because there's so few details in the book that I think people grasp onto those details that they are given. And so there's a worry, right, that like if you include something extraneous, it, it can actually distract from or, or confuse. Um, so yeah. I, I, I try to pair everything back. Yeah. Uh, just a forecast for folks in a, in about 10 minutes, we'll open it up to the audience for questions. And those questions can be submitted over Zoom as well. So, um, you know, be thinking about what you might want to ask. But for now, you're you're still all mine for another 10. <laughs> um, and I do want to uh, ask you to read one last section. And I, I guess I'm being selfish because it, it's such a, a luminous section. And it's also kind of towards the end of the book. It appears on uh, page 168. And it, uh, you know, I don't know if you've read anything so far that has uh, introduced um, Galen's character, but if you want to kind of set that up a little bit, that would be fine too. <laughs> yeah, so Galen's my partner. Uh, and and I think she has mentioned in the very first That's right. page, um, but just kind of like as a name. Uh, and this is the scene where we get married. Um, uh, and it is sort of the end of the book. I I do and I I'm like defensive about the fact that I put it near the end of the book. It's my own fault. Uh, I didn't. I I also didn't want you know like I over the course of the thing I was like I don't want to end with like a baby or getting married. Um, was like the the thing right. Uh, and there's a great line um, that I steal for the book. That's you know it used to be that when you died you had, in, in a tragedy you died and in a comedy you got hitched. And so I say in the book that I felt the urge to exit the story with the wedding, but I actually intentionally added like 20 more pages after the <laughs> wedding so I could say it didn't end on a wedding. Um, that's not the only reason, but it's one of the reasons. Uh, all right, here we go. The church is not air conditioned. I wear mostly white linen, which is supposed to breathe, but there are three layers and the vest does not breathe because it is not linen. So sweat is matting my hair and dripping into my eyes, and I have to remember not to lock my knees or I will faint. In the foyer, I hear the music I wrote, the music that set some of Elsie's wedding poems for organ, recorder, and voice. I am never doing this again, Molly sings. She sings again over and over. This kind of literalism is a trope in text setting. 
The word rings over and over like wedding bells. Maybe I will do this again. We are married, but we might we might one day be unmarried, but I will never do this again, I think. When we walk in, Molly sings an aria from a Bach cantata that I love. Clea and a woman I don't know play the recorder. Jacob plays the organ. It is lovely. I have never heard music more lovely. I notice it and I do not notice it. I have crossed into some state beyond calm and focused where I have never been before. Our siblings read poems and I look out as I look out at my friends and family and the waving sea of hand fans. Sarah starts reading Robert Hass. Dan reads E. Cummings. John reads Marge Piercy. Andrew Jack Gilbert. Then Kath is reading Galen, tearing up. Gillen Beebe, grain on grain on grain on grain on grain. I do not tear up, which surprises me. I am always tearing up at everything. Gillen is used to it by now. When I sniffle watching some trite TV show, she pats whatever part of me she can reach, but she keeps her face glued to the television. But now I am not crying. Later, we rush out of the church doors to the Vidor Toccata, the quick arpe arpeggios, the rough jabs of chords in the pedals, the sense of building wonderment. The song lifts me up, bodily hurls me from the church in one long run of joy. My mouth will not close. It is spread open in a surprised smile that won't leave. Our friends cry. After we sign the paperwork, Kareem grabs my head and puts our foreheads against each other. Galen and I have just vowed to try to love ourselves as much as we love each other. I find that I want to struggle this way. It puts the burden in the right place. Great. Um, I know, collective sigh. Um, one thing that that section references is your own relationship with music. And I, I've, we've accidentally occluded some of the sections that are more squarely about singing and, you know, in carols and songs. Do you want to just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So I, I went to Oberlin and Ra Oberlin. There's some people here who also went to Oberlin. Uh, and I went to the conservatory as well as the college. So I was double degree. And the conservatory, I played the recorder on the harpsichord, mostly the recorder, a little bit of the harpsichord. Um, and I love music. I think that what is most relevant in this book um, is, is actually the, the way music is constructed. Um, the idea of a theme that is developed, that is merged with other themes, the idea of kind of material, like the material of the music as being an important part of the construction process. I think that like when I built the book, I thought very clearly of here are the materials, here are the thematic materials I'm working with. And here's how I want them to evolve over the course of the book. And here's how I want them to intersect with each other over the course of the book and kind of be layered on top of each other. Um, and so that like infuses the book. I mean, also I reference a lot of music because I love music and that's great. Um, but uh, it's interesting. I feel like I come off way more fuddy-duddy in the book than I am in real life. Like, I don't just listen to Bach, but if you read the book, you're like, this guy listens to a lot of Bach, which is like true, I do. But also I listen to other stuff too, I swear to God. Um, so, and the Vitor Takata, yeah, it's a great song. Uh, yeah. um I I you know I, I that's great I, I I was thinking about well first off I have to admit I was thinking about other parts that I accidentally left out and tell me how your cat's name is pronounced uh Garyon. yes I will point out that I marked all the pages we were going to read from with my cat post-its just to just to mark that so I'm a fan of Garyon. um you are experiencing a really funny time of your life you're bringing out a book, you've just won a pretty major prize for your, your in your journalism career. I will, I, I'll say it's, but you don't have to. I actually find bringing out a book thrilling, but also a lot of times um, humbling in the moment. There's a lot of little moments that leave you feeling vulnerable. And I'm just curious how, you know, we've spent all this time with what's on the page. How are you feeling as an author in three dimensions right yeah. now? Yeah, it's a great question. I actually, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to pick one to read really great. fast because I think it's I relevant. That. Um which is, let's see if I can, if I can't find them in the next five seconds, I will not do it, but um, go, 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 go. <laughs> um, okay, here it is, great, okay. Um, between the baby in my home and the baby in these pages, there is a connection, but never be confused. One I love because she is herself, but if I love the other, then I fear I am gazing softly into a pond, wasting away, Narcissus with the keyboard. Um, and I think, I think about this all the time that like, I wrote this book that's like very much about my life and it is all true. Um, and then also like, it's not me at all in this mm -hmm. weird way. Right. And, and I, I, um, you know, my, my partner and my daughter are in this book and it's like them, but it's not them. It's a very uncanny thing to see people know all this stuff about my life and not know anything about my life. Mm -hmm. Um, because the book is very revealing, I think, in a lot of ways. And yet, like, people don't actually know me, <laughs> you know, from reading mm -hmm. the book. Um, and so it's, it's kind of a very uncanny, like, 
too bad anyway. So that that's been weird. The polls are great. Was when was great. And shout out to Chad and uh, Chad Day and James Grimaldi who are on the team with me. Uh, that's awesome. They're both here. Um, I'd never met James Grimaldi before. We worked on this project for like ten months. So that was <laughs> it's nice. Um, a lot. Oh, that's a lot. Yeah. Uh, it it's been it's been really it's a weird time. It's a weird time. We also have just moved. There's like all this. We moved from Boston to the Hudson Valley. So it's like there's been a lot of changes in the last year, and I feel like. Um, the book has been wonderful in a lot of ways. And mm-hmm. it's also, it does feel um, like I'm naked and yet wearing prosthetics. <laughs> my body. Like, I don't know. It's very weird. Uh, mm-hmm. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. How do you sustain a sense of community specific to your creative writing? Because it sounds like you've got a lot going on in a lot of different circles. So yeah. it, is it Zoom? Is it email? Is it hanging <laughs> <It's> out? <laughs> mostly email, uh, some Zoom. Um uh, one of my friends is here and we, we, we write each other on Fridays. Um, there's a group of us who write every Friday, uh, to each other just to check in about what we did this week writing wise. And it's actually moved quite beyond writing and it's just like what we've been up to that week, but it's a really lovely practice. Um, I also, I will confess, I haven't been writing that much recently because okay. I've been pretty busy, but I was um, not going to ask you yeah. what you were working on. <laughs> I would never do that. <laughs> I'm working on a rom-com, actually, a, an honest-to-God rom-com, and I'm really excited about it, and I hope it one day sees the light of day. It's work out, but... <laughs> let me do a check-in with the audience, and let me say that I will go ahead and repeat the question back into the microphone, if that's okay, just to make sure that folks listening in get a clear audio of it. Is there anybody who wants to help move the conversation forward by asking something? Okay. Uh, so I want to I, uh, thank you for this really interesting um i want to hear a little bit about the writing process like um that, because i know how hard you worked this last year with chad and i uh when you actually wrote the book because i can't imagine that you wrote it while we were doing this project but maybe you did <laughs> uh and then how you got from a hundred thousand words to thirty thousand words did you have a an editor? Did you have a, you know, did, you, did the publisher help you? What was your process? So just to uh, echo that back, uh, when on earth did you write this book physically, <laughs> logistically? Uh, how how did the time for it uh, fit in with your other responsibilities? And then also how did the the painful editing process happen? And, and if, if that was your team with the press or something else? Yeah. So I started, um, I started writing this book seven years ago or actually now seven and a half years ago. So it's been a long process to to write it. Uh, I started writing it at grad school. I actually was writing a very different book at grad school about the internet. I don't know if you guys know what Link Rot is. I was writing a book about Link Rot and I was like really psyched about it. And I was writing it in grad school and my and I was, and you have to write 20 pages every week. It's a lot of work. It's actually a surprising amount of like, surprisingly difficult to write 20 new pages of material while you're having a full-time job in grad school. So I, I was like, oh, all right, well, how am I gonna do this? Uh, and I wrote some personal stuff that I took some personal stuff that I had lying around and sent it in. And my press was like, I'm way more interested in this personal stuff than the book about the internet that you're writing. So why don't you write some more of that for me? So I started writing this book at, at grad school in that way. And um, I think during Cap Ass- during Capital Assets, the name of the project was Capital Assets that we worked on. I think during that project, I was doing the final round of editing on this book uh, during some of it. Um, there's a huge amount of time between when you submit the book and when the book actually comes out, uh, it, it was, I think it was about a year and a half since acquisition until book came out. Uh, and over the course of that, that in that meantime, I did have to do quite a bit of editing, but actually th- they wanted more words. Um, mm-hmm. So I had to to find a way to inject more length into the book. It was about 25,000 mm-hmm. and now it's about 33 or 34. So it's, you know, I added back some material that I had taken out. I took the material out myself Um I think it was a. I, I submitted the book a number of times to various agents and to various publishers and gotten a lot of rejections before this it found its last home. Um, and I think that those rejections taught me that the book was not ready uh, or that maybe it was kind of unpublishable. I mean, it's, it's kind of a weird book. It's like a hard book to sell. I think I was very relieved when it sold for any money. At all. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I actually cut it down myself and that was a really painful process. Um, but every time I did it, I think the book got better. So editors who knew they're yeah. actually good uh yeah another question 
while you all are thinking one up. I wonder, speaking of which, if you want to speak briefly about the relationship with the publisher and any highlights of that partnership. Yeah, so give them uh, a shout out. Yeah, give them a shout out. So hi, Erdman's. Um, so Erdman's is a publisher based at Grand Rapids. They do mostly kind of Christian uh, studies books. Um, I think the or religious studies books. I can't remember one religious studies or theology. One is if you're in it. One is if you're not in it. I don't remember which is which. Probably theology is the one if you're in it. Exciting. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. 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 Theology is the one if you're in it. So they they say that they are both theology and religious studies. So they do both in and without, but uh, focusing on religion. And they're they have a new acquisitions editor, Lisa Cockrell, who we went to grad school with. Uh, and she wants to. She said that what she wants is to. Uh, like gray wolf i don't know if you guys know what gray wolf is it's a wonderful press she says she wants it to be like gray wolf but if gray wolf was obsessed with god um and so that's what her, that's she a great log line <laughs> right yeah so that's what she wants her books to be and so she that was her first acquisition um and i don't know i mean it's been great working with them it's been interesting working with them they they you know if you bought it from the publisher directly you get signed up for christianbooks.org which is like sure i mean that's great but like also like maybe alienating to some people i don't know like you know like it's mm-hmm. uh it's certainly maybe alienating even to me right like i don't know that i would have thought of myself as like wanting to go to a christian publisher uh and so that is a a, a kind of an interesting tension mm-hmm. but i think it's been really wonderful to navigate it with lisa and with the press because they are so committed to yeah. Um, to being legible and to being welcoming to other people. And I think that that's been a really wonderful part of this process has been seeing how they are um, trying, not always, maybe not always as successfully as they want to be, but trying to um, to be accessible. Uh, that's for- how spaces grow. That's how they flex. Yeah, yeah, that's terrific. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, John, you say something all the time that I think is one of my favorite things. Is when you say how hard it is to write only two true things. And I'm just interested in how you inquired about going back and kind of investigating yourself yeah. throughout this process and how you poked and made sure that what you were finding was true and, and, and read true. Yeah. So the question is about holding oneself to the standard of, of truth telling, right? Particularly when you're reaching back in, in memory and interrogating older versions of yourself. Yeah. yeah, working at the journal has been a real exercise and, and we do these long fact-checking processes and it's like, saying only true things is really, really hard. And I think people like don't necessarily always appreciate that, just how challenging that is. Um, and the fortunate thing about this book is that there are a lot fewer facts in it that aren't, that are coming from outside of me. Um, there are facts in it. I think I actually may have gotten one thing, like a date wrong in the book. I'm not going to tell you what the date is, uh, but I think I did get a date wrong in the book. It's a correctable error, uh, uh, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. So no one will know. But, you know, but, but the thing is like, like I did, I did a, a really close read um, with the publisher. They had, they hired a copy editor. I printed off the book in its proof form and went through it just like like literally line by line like we did. Uh, the weird thing was that the stuff that was not true the most was stuff that I had written before Vinny, before my daughter. Sorry, I don't name her in the book, but now you know my daughter's name is Lavinia. Uh, but the stuff that I had written before Vinny, and it wasn't that the facts were wrong, but rather how I understood those facts were wrong. And I, I ended up changing a few things kind of at the last minute about how I was feeling about stuff. As opposed to, so that was a really interesting part of this was like, I mean, it, it, it's like, there's no analog that I can think of in, in like a story necessarily, but there were there, it was, it was interesting to see how I got most of the actual facts, right. Um, but how I felt about those facts changed over the course. I mean, it was seven years and a lot of them shifted over the course of the seven years. So, yeah. And when someone, and I, I doubt it's me for the first time, but when someone for the first time, you know, brought up like what your daughter might experience when she reads this book someday, what was your thought process there? I hope she likes it. Uh, it's like the whole thing's Fair. kind of a love, love letter to her in a lot of ways. I mean, you know, and I, I think I do talk about the struggle of, of, I was, I was unprepared for how unprepared um, I was to raise a kid. Uh, I think, I think everyone's basically kind of unprepared to raise a kid at some level. Like, you know, like, like you come with no real idea of what it's going to be like, who knows? Yeah. Who knows what you're going to get? You never know what you're going to get. Right. Uh, life is like a box of infants. Um, and, uh, and I, I think that 
that level of unpreparedness and also the seeing the gulf between the person that I thought I was going to be and the person that I actually was, was really hard for me. And so I, a lot of this book, and also our daughter was born on April 16, 2020. I don't know if you remember what was going on then, but it was not a great time. Um, and, um, and also this is referenced in the book, you know, our, our daughter was in foster care uh, when we met her uh, and, and we were foster parents to her for a very long time. And, and that, um, all of those things were like, just like extra fun things that I was like unprepared for. I was unprepared for an infant. I was unprepared to, to raise, um, to raise an infant. I, we were not expecting an infant. We were not expecting an infant. So like, that was like, you know, that was one thing. We had like no notice, like this is in the book, right? Like we had very little notice. <laughs> um, and I think that like those, those challenges uh, compounded, but I, I hope that what she sees when she reads the book is, is like how much her, being in our life has mm -hmm. changed who I am and like made me, I think I like to think like I'm like Charizard now, like I was Charmander and I'm Charizard. <laughs> I don't know what the final form is, but like I'm getting there hopefully. Um, like maybe it's not true for everyone, but like, at least for me, I think that like having a kid has forced me to make changes into my life that I've wanted to make for a long time. And I finally am making them. And I think it's a direct result of being a parent. I don't think that's true for everyone. I think people are able to change all the time without having kids, but like for me, this was the thing that did it. Uh, and so I'm really grateful to her. I hope that comes through in the book. But. Yeah, absolutely. Other questions? Oh, we have two. Um, I'll go to you first, Britt, and then we'll go. Oh, so John, you submitted the book so well. Um, and you talk a little bit about how um, your journalism practice has impacted your writing for you to read, but I wondered if the opposite is true as well, if um, working on this book is sort of deepening your creative practice has also changed how you approach your own writing. Mm -hmm. Do you want to that for them. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so if we think through uh, the impact of being a journalist on this book's writing process, is the reverse also true? Has, has doing the work on this book maybe changed in some ways how you would approach that aspect of your writing? It's interesting. I, I feel like a lot of journalism is much more about assembly than writing. Um, you assemble the facts into kind of a coherent structure that enables readers to grasp what you're reporting with as much efficiency as possible. And so like the concern is someone in something different. Like it is writing, it's writing, don't get me wrong. And there's certainly like, there's magazine style journalism, which is even more kind of, you know, but I, I think especially the kind of newspaper form that, that I generally work in is very much about like putting facts in logical order and a lot less about the, the, the craft of it, if that makes sense. And that's not to say that people don't worry about the craft of the journal. I mean, like people write very well, but what what this book, writing the book has given me more confidence, I will say, at work around, I mean, I'm a data monkey for the most part. I, I, I work in- <laughs> A Pulitzer winning <laughs> data monkey. <laughs> data monkey. Uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, but like, I don't, I don't generally, I'm not generally the person who actually writes the last, like writes the copy that goes to the editor that then is put in the paper. That's very rarely me. I will oftentimes write a paragraph that gets- broken up and put into a bunch of other paragraphs and then gets put in the story. And then that goes to the editor. Yeah. But I will say I've gotten more confident in the book, but I, I actually think that like, I, I'm not sure Brit, like, that's a really good question. Like, how has it really changed? I think I've gotten more confident. I definitely think I, um, but it's funny, right? Like people at the journal will say like, Oh, you wrote a book. And it's like, yeah, I wrote a book. And they're like, what's what, 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 what about? Like, you know, it's like, well, it's not about any of the stuff that like is remotely related to my work, you know? Um, and which is, I mean, everyone's been great about it, but it is funny to, to, to like the expectation is I would write a book about something I covered and then it's, it's not, um, I have to think about that though. That's a good question. And, and maybe a question that will be answered across time, yes, right? There might be right. a different impact six yeah. months from now. Yeah. We had another question. Hmm. So, so drawing attention to the fact that since the child was not in the picture seven years ago, when the book began, what, what, how did it have to change over time? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. Uh, the book used to be called um, Convex Mirror. And it was really obsessed with, it was like, a, there was a lot of close reading of John Ashbery's poem, Self-Portrait in a Convex Mirror, which itself is a nephrastic poem describing a work by a Italian Renaissance painter whose name I cannot pronounce, Parmigianino. There are like four INs in it in, in a row. It's very hard to say. Um, and it was, it was much more kind of like this like meditation on the self, man. And like, that's still there in the book, but I, I'm like really grateful that it's not 
the book that I wrote. Um, uh, I did, I did query it. Like you so said, the process of getting an agent is a nightmare. Um, you, you send, you cold email a bunch of people and then like one of them is like, sure, I'll read your thing. And then they, they read it for like seven months later, they get back to you and they're like, no, I'm good. Or they don't get back to you. Right. Like that's like the process of agents. Uh, and I created a bunch of agents and like, I got a couple of people wrote feedback. That I was like, yeah, no, like this is not, this is not working. Right. Um, and I think that they were right, uh, that the book needed more oomph to it. And so I'm really glad that it wasn't just kind of a meditation on like what it means to be a changing self and like very philosophical. And I've quoted Wittgenstein way more than I do in right now. And, you know, it was, it was, it was what it was. I think there's a version of that book that maybe is interesting, but it was not that book. Other questions? Yeah. So I'm curious. Um, it's, uh, it's Erdman's called Lessons and Carols. You alluded to a bit of a structure around the sort of the, the Lessons and Carols structure and all that. So uh, to what extent is there sort of a, a substrate around uh, belief or faith or mm -hmm. God or whatever um, that's in there? I mean, it, and it sounds like it, that may have been one of the things that changed in those seven years there. So just how, yeah. how does that sort of fit into all of this? Yeah. Oh, so, sorry. so given the publisher, given the intentionality of the structure, to what extent is is religion or faith kind of a squarely under undercurrent theme or outright theme? <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a theme in the book. Um, I think that a lot of the books move, like the big the big move that the book does is it takes something that's a, like a, a binary, um, in this case, belief, unbelief, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and it says that maybe that's the wrong question to be asking. Uh, and that's the move I do over and over again. It's like the whole the whole gimmick of the book. Um, gimmick is a strong word. I don't know why I said that about that. Uh, it's the move it makes. Um, and, uh, and, you know, there's a great um, Wittgenstein quote that I, I put in the book, which is like, speaking of Wittgenstein, which is, um, he says, the questions which one comes back to again and again is if bewitched. These I should like to expunge from philosophical language. He's talking about skepticism. He's talking about Cartesian skepticism in that quote. Um, this idea that like there is, you know, is there a, you know, are we just brains and bats or not, basically, right? Uh, and uh, and he was like, this is a dumb question, a boring question. I don't want to ask it, but people are obsessed with it. Why are people obsessed with that? I feel like I'm obsessed with questions of faith. And yet I know, and I, I wrote a whole book about in part, that that question is, fundamentally not the question that I that I think is the interesting one. The interesting one isn't actually like, do I believe in a literal God or not? I think the interesting question is like, how does engagement with this tradition change who I am? And, and what does it mean for the world around me when I do engage with it more or less? And that like that that question puts puts like the question of actual honest to God faith, like what like what is faith, right? I mean like that's get like really like freshman dorm smoking a blunt but like what is faith right like what is that i don't know um and and i think uh i think that that this book's primary move is to say what is it maybe maybe we can be concerned about it in a different way or we can see it differently there's um i'm gonna i'm really just riffing on my own book here but like there's a uh I, there's a part in the book where i talk about um uh the, the ship of theseus which is this <laughs> ship that the athenians wanted to commemorate and they replaced every bit of the ship until it was like completely not original and the question is is it the same ship right oh no and then roland barris a few not a few years later many many years later writes his book and he mistakes the ship of theseus for the argo and then maggie nelson writes a book called the argonauts and there's this writer melissa mescu wonders kind of cheekily is a paradox still the same after all its parts have been replaced which i love that's a great line Good job, Melissa ask you. Um, I also like think that that this like question of like, is a paradox still the same after all its parts have been replaced is like a fun question to ask. But the whole book, the whole time, what I'm doing is identifying paradoxes in my life and saying that is that the way I'm viewing that paradox is what's causing getting me stuck. And there has to be another way to view it. Uh, and sometimes I find the other way and sometimes I don't. Uh, I think I don't really with faith. I think I think I'm still struggling with that one because I don't. Um, I don't necessarily want to be a believer, but I think I might be, which is very confusing for a lot of people. It very, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very Christian Wyman is a great, yeah. Christian Wyman is a great uh, Christian poet, uh, Christian, uh, hilariously Christian poet. Um, uh, this Brilliant Abyss, is that, was that the name? Right. Bright Abyss. Bright Abyss. Bright Abyss. Mm -hmm. Amazing book of poetry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That book changed my life though, the Bright Abyss. Um, 
And I'm glad you're I'm glad you're riffing because I think for those who are uh you know hopefully looking forward confidently to buying their copy, but if anyone's on the fence, I think that that's part of the magic and the charisma of the book is these kind of digressions or or asides. Um, you mentioned of the mentor who was a writer uh, who steered you towards this focus for the book in progress, and I'm curious just if you have a favorite. A uh, piece of writing advice that you've absorbed from a mentor over the years, and it could be about craft on the page, or it could just be about like living as an yeah. author. But that you feel that sticks with you, or that you feel is particularly relevant to this book. Sure. So it was Susan Cheever was the name of the person who, um, who told me uh, that she was not interested in the book I was writing. It was interested in this other stuff. Uh, classic Susan. Uh, and to stick with the the Susan Cheever theme, Susan Cheever is a great um writer she wrote um a memoir what is it called oh my gosh it's going to drive me about her father um john cheever uh, the famous short story writer and that memoir is an incredible book and i cannot remember it's name. always coming home and that's ursula Le Guin. Ooh, uh it's got i don't know it's, it's coming home is somewhere in the title it's a great memoir if you have your phone and you want to look it up i would love that uh so no worries um so it's a great it's a great memoir uh and it was kind of like one of the four like, I don't know, like, I think people say oftentimes like Susan Cheever is like one of these names of women writers who are doing something new with memoir uh, and kind of brought it into a new phase when it was happening. So she's an amazing writer. Um, she told me the craziest, uh, can I swear? I'm gonna swear, craziest shit ever, which is she throws away a draft. She will like literally delete it from her computer and then reconstitute it from memory as a way of getting unstuck. And I was like, that is the craziest <laughs> batshit thing i've ever heard like 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 you're just like throwing away so don't do that um but uh but i i do think that like she's on to something about like defamiliarizing yourself from the text and so um that i think is useful that is very useful in both creative writing or non-creative writing is just to like put the text in different color change the background color change mm -hmm. the font size like all these things like really help mm -hmm. see it in different light what i like to do is I like to pretend like it's a poem and then jam it like poorly um, and then it's just like, it's like not, a, it's not prose anymore. Right. Like, and, mm -hmm. and it's, it doesn't work at all as a poem, but I, I see it in a new way. Mm -hmm. um, another fun, uh, fun thing you can do, which I, if you ever want to be really humbled is feed ChatGPT some of your work mm -hmm. and then ask it to replicate <laughs> your work and about something else. And it will just roast you. It's merciless. Um, <laughs> it knows, it knows no shame. Uh, <laughs> it makes you feel bad about yourself. Uh, so they're all, all fun techniques. <laughs> Um, I want to be mindful of of time, and I'm just to check in. I'm assuming there's no questions from the Zoom audience, but okay, no worries. Um, does anybody have one last question? It would have to be a fairly rapid fire one, and it cannot be about AI or Chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Just because we don't want to open that can of worms in our last two minutes. <laughs> anybody have anything else? Uh, either when you got. When you got the news that the book had found a home yeah. or, uh, you know, when you or when you first time you saw it, when you opened up in the box and saw the finished copies, yeah. is there one little thing that you have done for yourself to just celebrate and hold space and honor this pretty cool thing? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I had a really good steak um, when I got the news. There's always something. There's always something. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I think like. The, it's ongoing. The more will be revealed. Um, uh, and I, I'm optimistic that uh, we, we've been, it's been a really crazy time uh, in personally in our life. Um, we had some family, death in the family. We moved like three times in the last year. Um, so it's been a really crazy time. And yeah. um, I'm optimistic that at some point things will settle down and I will not be quite so frantic and I will actually be able to really save for this. Um, but that time is yet to arrive. Uh, so. Well, we will look forward to whatever books spring out of that. Uh, you know, life keeps going. Yeah. That's the thing about it. Uh, I want to thank you for your time. You're incredibly thoughtful uh, answers to my my questions and the questions from the audience, the readings we got to hear. Uh, a round of applause, I would hope. <laughs> I'm going to turn it over. Yes, thank you, everybody. And let me. I'll be back here. Um, just give us just a moment to get out my little signing table. If you would like to purchase a copy, they're all upstairs, and then we can get the signing going, and it'll be great. Thank you. <laughs>